and thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson in which we will be covering the Old Testament card, Joseph is Betrayed, and its connection to the New Testament card, Judas Betrays Jesus. We'll be particularly looking at Articles 7 and 9 of the Apostles' Creed. First, before we get in uh, to the actual connection, uh, let's first look at the story of Genesis 37. Um, and, and around that area, if you read there, you'll read the story of um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had the 12 sons. One of those 12 sons was Joseph. And Joseph um, was sent, he was, he was the, the second youngest of the 12. And he was home with his father, Jacob, and his brothers had gone off. His brothers had gone off to another region, another area. And um, Jacob asked Joseph to go and find his brothers. And so Joseph does that. He's obedient to his father. And he goes off to the um, other region, the other uh, area. And there is a man there in that area. And he says to the man, uh, the man says, can I help you? And Joseph says, I, I'm in search of my brethren. I come searching for my brothers. Um, what happens then is the brothers see him coming from a distance and they plan to first kill him, but then one of the brothers says, no, let's don't kill him, let's sell him into slavery. And so this right here obviously is, is a deep connection with Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of Joseph and how Joseph is a type of Christ. What did Christ do? He was sent by the Father. God the Father sends God the Son, Jesus, in search for his brethren. Who are his brethren? His brethren is every man and every woman. Um, why are we his brothers and sisters? Because he takes on humanity. He takes on our humanity and he makes himself our brother. Um, so we truly are his brother, his, his, his brethren. He comes in search for his brethren. As we see him coming, this is the incarnation, as we see him coming, what do we see that um, his brethren do to him? They begin to betray him. We see this already with Herod and all of Jerusalem already betraying him, going against him. We see this in his ministry, and we see this, of course, most perfectly in his passion as death. And we see this again as Judas, even one of his own, one of his uh, beloved, one of his friends, betrays him. So Jesus Christ in the incarnation comes and searches for his brethren, but his brethren do not um, welcome him. They do not pay attention to the visit. What can we learn from this? Well, we know that Jesus is also in search for us. And we need to not betray him, but instead accept him. At this point in the lesson, um, or in the whole course, I want to go through uh, Wisdom 10. And it's particularly 1 through 21, because we see in Wisdom 10, we actually see the entire course of salvation history. So what I would like to do is go ahead and read the verses, uh, verse or verses, and then you'll see the card that's connecting to it. Now remember here, Wisdom, <coughs> she, every time you see the pronoun she here, it's going to be referring to wisdom, um, or, or in Greek, Sophia. So wisdom is a female, uh, or, or we, we call wisdom a female. We give it the feminine. Um, now we know that Jesus Christ is wisdom incarnate. He is the Word made flesh. And so you could also say here, every time you see uh, the pronoun she, which is wisdom, you could put Jesus in there for wisdom. Um, so here we see she preserved him. Who's the him here? Adam. Um, Jesus preserved Adam. In fact, Jesus was here. It's his story, history. It's his story, and he is preserving the just in every situation. So now we'll go through, starting with Adam, working our way all the way to Jesus Christ himself. Wisdom 10, 1 and 2. She preserved Adam that was first formed by God, the Father of the world, when he was created alone, and she brought him out of his sin and gave him power to govern all things. Wisdom 10.3, but when the unjust Cain went away from her, when he went away from wisdom, when he went away from Christ in his anger, he persisted by the fury wherewith he murdered his brother. Wisdom 10.4, for whose cause when water destroyed the earth, wisdom healed it again to Christ healing the earth, directing the course of the just Noah by contemptible wood. Wisdom 10.5, Moreover, when the nations had conspired together, this is the Tower of Babel, to consent to wickedness, she knew the just Abraham and preserved him without blame to God and kept him strong against the compassion for his son. 
So what we see here is there is a, a legend that Abraham was some of the just men, one of the just men that was at the Tower of Babel, some of the men that were actually resisting the building, and God preserved him from that. Wisdom 10.6, she delivered the just man Lot, who fled from the wicked that were perishing when the fire came down upon the Pentopolis. Wisdom 10.10, 10. she conducted the just Jacob, who, whose name will be changed to Israel, when he fled his brother's wrath, that's Esau, through the right ways, and showed him the kingdom of God, and gave him knowledge of the holy things, made him honorable in his labors, and accomplished his labors. Wisdom 10, 13 through 14. She forsook not the just, Joseph, when he was sold, but delivered him from sinners. She went down with him into the pit, and in bands she left him not, till she brought him the scepter of the kingdom, and power against those that oppressed him, and showed them to be liars that had accused him, and gave him everlasting glory. So this is the particular one I want to focus on a little bit more because the typology is so perfect here. So when we say she, we're saying that wisdom, of course, was with Joseph, but we're also saying that Christ was with Joseph. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are never separated, right? Um, the Blessed Trinity. And so um, Jesus is present um, throughout all of these uh, just men's life. Um, and so when we see this, we see that Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not only present with Joseph, but this also applies to Jesus himself. And so it is, it is Jesus that was sold, right? When he was sold, it'll be Jesus that is going to be delivered from the sinners. It'll be Jesus that goes down into the pit. He descends into hell, right? Jesus will not be left in bands. He will not be left tied up. Um, humanity will not be left in the, in the bands of the devil. But um, he will, uh, Jesus Christ will break those bands through his passion, death, and resurrection. And Jesus Christ will have the scepter. The scepter of the kingdom will be given to Jesus Christ. He is the king of kings, and he now has the full dominion, um, the power over Satan. And so he has the power against the oppressor, Satan. And all those that accused him are now liars. We know that to be the case, um, that, that rejected him. And then he is given everlasting glory. What is that everlasting glory through? It's, of course, his resurrection but then his ascension, and then, of course, he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and there will be that final judgment where every knee will bend and every tongue will confess that he indeed is Lord. He has the dominion. Um, he has the, the glory. Wisdom 10, 16, 18, and 19. She entered into the soul of the servant of God, Moses, and stood against dreadful kings and wonders and signs, and she brought them through the Red Sea and carried them over through a great water. But their enemies she drowned in the sea, and from the depth of hell she brought them out. Um, I want to say a little bit about this one too. We know that Red Sea is, um, is like baptism, going through baptism, away from slavery into the promised land. And that's the crossing through those waters of baptism. And, and it will be, just like we read here, and they, um, but their enemies she drowned in the sea, and from the depth of hell she brought them out. And so um, it is through baptism that our enemies, the devil, the flesh, and the world, are drowned truly, and we renounce them. And then we are brought, each individual person baptized is brought from the depth of hell, um, that Jesus brings us out of that, like bringing us out of the water um, from death into life. We are a new creation. Wisdom 10.21, for wisdom, this is Jesus, the word made flesh, opened the mouth of the dumb and made the tongues of infants eloquent. Um, so this fulfillment, of course, is in the person of Jesus Christ. He heals those that cannot speak, um, loosening their mouth so they can speak. And um, we, we know in scripture that it will be the babes, the infants that will cry out, especially Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, and so it'll be, um, this is a or this is a prophe prophecy itself, but then it will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And this lesson, of course, will be um, centering on Judas um, and, and how Judas, one of the twelve. So in our last lesson, we talked about the twelve apostles. Well, the greatest scandal here is that even one of the closest of his friends will betray him. 
And, and so we'll be focusing on Judas, but we'll also focus on Peter and mainly focusing on ourself, the communion of saints, and how is it that those within the church, if Judas, who was one of the twelve, could betray Jesus, is it possible that the communion of saints, we believe in a communion of saints, is it possible that those here on earth, the church triumphant, could also betray Jesus, that Jesus is betrayed by his own? And so although we're, we're pointing the finger here in a sense at Judas, who did make his own choice. Uh, it says in the Acts of the Apostles that Jews, Judas chose his own place. But when is it that we choose our own place? A place apart from Jesus Christ, a place apart from his will, a place that will originally, uh, eventually lead us into uh, separation from, from him for all eternity, which is hell. In this illustration, we see that um, we have Jesus, and Jesus will be making his way to the cross. Um, in the scripture, Jesus will say to the apostles, including Peter and Judas, that the Son of Man will be betrayed and that he will die. Um, and so what happens with that is Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus and says, no, this cannot be. He opposes. He becomes a stumbling block for Jesus. Uh, Peter will place himself between Jesus and the cross. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He says to Peter, get behind me. Um, and so Jesus is here removing Peter as the stumbling block, removing him out of the way and saying, get behind me. Peter, of course, will get behind him and he will <clears throat> take serious the words of Jesus to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And so what we see here in this case is Jesus um, calling Peter out, rebuking him, saying, get behind me. And Peter is obedient. Uh, he, of course, will follow Jesus, even following Jesus to the cross by the own way, his own way that he will be martyred, um, which he will be crucified upside down in Rome. Um, now Judas is another case here. We see that Judas also places himself between Jesus and the cross. He opposes what Jesus is doing. Um, just as Jesus had said you are, you, to Peter, you are thinking not as man, uh, not as God, but as a man. Um, and G Judas continues to persist in that. He continues to stay in that spot between Jesus and the cross. He continues to remain a snare, a stumbling block. And we'll see later on in this lesson how many times Jesus calls him out, but Judas persistently, stubbornly, pridefully stays. He stays an obstacle between Jesus and the cross. And as scripture says in Acts, that Judas chooses his own place. He will not follow Jesus. He will not um, go from his own will to the will of, of, of God. And so he will choose his own place. This own place and choosing his own place causes him to fall into despair. And he will go to his own place, a place opposed to Jesus Christ for all eternity, which is hell. In the Apostles' Creed, Article 7, we say that from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Jesus Christ is our judge and he will come to judge us. And so we need to decide, are we being an obstacle between Jesus and the cross? Where do we stand? Are we choosing our own place as Judas chose his own place? Or like Peter, are we choosing Christ's place? Are we placing ourselves behind Jesus and following him? So here you see us and Christ in the cross. Is there anything in our life? Is there anything that's getting between us and Christ, between us and the cross? And this is sin. Anything that could be um, a snare to us, a scandal to us, a stumbling block, anything that is uh, basically preventing us from coming to Christ. And so we have to examine ourselves and we have to ask this question. This is what scandal is. It's when things get between us and Christ. And so we can never be this, this scandal for other people, but we want to also remove any scandal in our life. And that's what we'll be talking on this lesson. Now we see, actually, it will be uh, Jesus Christ that will conquer sin, Satan, and death. And so what he wants to do, and we'll see this in the next drawing, is, is Christ is going to want to place himself by his incarnation, his passion, his death, and his resurrection. He's wanting to place himself between us and sin. That's what God wants for us, is he wants um, to place himself between us and sin. Um, the question is, what do we want? Um, so we want sin, Satan, and death to be, of course, behind, uh, and, and we don't want anything to do with it. We want to come to Christ. We want to come to the cross. We want nothing between us and Christ, nothing between us and the cross. And so Jesus, in his love and his mercy, steps in 
knowing that Christ has come, knowing that he has sought us out to seek his brethren, knowing that he places himself in front of sin, Satan, and death to rescue us, how harmful it really is and how offensive it is that we would then keep sin um, ahead of him. Um, so this is really the question. Do, do we put sin, do we prefer um, sin to Christ? Do we prefer any love of another thing, another person? Do we prefer anything to the love of Christ? Do we um, follow anything or adore anything other than Christ? In this diagram, we're going to continue the lesson on holy orders where we see that the priest's job, bishop's job, is to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. And we're going to be talking about now scandals to those things. So the first that we will talk about is the scandal of heresy. That um, heresy is actually going to attack the teaching nature of the church. That Jesus Christ gave the authority to teach. It was the mission of Christ to teach, to pass on the faith. And heresy is when someone will choose um, what they want to believe and what they do not. And so in all the areas of faith and morals, they will choose particular things, but then reject others. Paul, speaking to Timothy, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, entreat, rebuke, and all patience and doctrine. For there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth, but will be made turned unto fables. But be thou vigilant, labor in all things, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober. For I am even now ready to be sacrificed um, and the time of my dissolution is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. As to the rest, there is laid up to me a crown of justice, which the Lord, the just judge, uh, the Lord, the just judge will render to me in that day, and not only to me, but to them also that love His coming. Make haste to come to me quickly. So here, uh, Paul is telling us that it's very clear that um, there will be a time, and I think this is every time, that people will prefer fables, falsehood, to truth. We know that Justin Martyr said that one of the marks of the Christian is someone that moves from falsehood to truth. He says, as Christians, we are not allowed to move from truth to falsehood, but only falsehood to truth. And so what we see in heresy is a person within the church, a part of the communion of saints, the church uh, militant, the church on earth, choosing particular things of faith and morals that they want to follow and rejecting others. Um, this has also been nicknamed cafeteria Catholic because you have all the faith and morals out there and we should accept all of them. But instead of accepting all or professing all, we only pick a few that we like or even maybe just pick a handful that we don't like. A few examples of heresy um, from the history of the church and then maybe one more modern one would be that of Arianism. Um, Arianism uh, was very prevalent in the 300s, 400s, 500s around that time in the early church. And Arianism were people within the church that refused to believe the doctrine of faith that Jesus Christ is God. Um, this heresy was cleared up by um, two ecumenical councils uh, particularly. And um, of course the church taught or reiterated that yes, we do believe that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. Um, we know that um, you know that, that these truths are, are preached by Christ, but who then um, teaches them? Who has the final say on the interpretation? Um, we know that the Catholic Church uh, not only taught these things, but then formed the Bible, and it will be the church that has the um, authority, the magisterium is what we call it, the authority to actually teach and transmit the faith. Um, Protestantism would reject that, that it's not coming particularly from the bishops or from the magisterium, but a personal interpretation. So this is just one example of a few areas of faith um, areas that were rejected, um, that were chosen. And then um, even now we see in our time uh, that the real presence, the doctrine of the real presence, which is just the belief that in the Eucharist, in Holy Communion, Jesus Christ is present, both body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's called the real presence. And we have people within the church. Again, all of these uh, heresies happen within first. 
They can lead to separation, but they always happen within first. These are Catholics. This is part of the communion of saints that are choosing certain things and rejecting others instead of saying, I believe in all of the teachings. Those who will pick and choose faith and moral issues are likely either to split altogether from the communion of the saints or they will stay, but they will persist in their, in their error. Um, schism is a split against the governance of the church. And so just as heresy attacks the teaching authority of the church, schism actually attacks the governance. Um, the governance, as we learned before, is really resting in the bishops in union with the Holy Father. So the bishops and the Holy Father as they are governing or shepherding. And so a schism is when we uh, choose to not unite. Um, actually, when we say we do not accept the authority of, um, of the church, of the hierarchy. And uh, St. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen 18 through 19. Uh, he will talk about how heresies, there are heresies there, but also there are schisms there. And we see here that when someone is uh, picking and choosing what they want to believe, then they may also eventually challenge the authority of those that teach. And so it will be the bishops that are teaching. If someone is continuing saying, no, I don't believe that, no, I don't believe that, not only will they reject the teaching, but they also may get to a point where they reject the governance. Um, a, 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 a person in the communion of saints may not always like the personality of the person governing them, but they still accept the authority. We even say that at every Mass. We pray for, by name, we pray for our Pope, and we pray by name for our Bishop. And so we see that there is still a unity. There is a unity with our Bishop. There is a unity with our Holy Father. There is an acceptance of their authority and their shepherding over us. Um, when we say that we believe in the communion of saints, we are saying that we believe, of course, that those in heaven, those in purgatory, those in, in, on earth, um, but particularly those on earth, the church militant, that we are like... Um, those that are in the net. Remember, the, the apostles cast that net into the, um, into the ocean, into the lake, and the, the lake being the world, casting the net and gathering both good and bad fish. Um, you, you, we hear the story of the field in, in which the person sowed the wheat, but then later on the enemy came and sowed weeds. And so the field is the church. There are the weeds, there are the wheat. Um, the church is the net. There are the good fish, and there are the bad fish. Um, but what we need to make sure, even though we are in this net, even though we are in this field, even though we are in this church, um, that we stay in union with the authority of the Holy Father, the authority of the bishop, and we stay in union with those that are in united with the governance, with the shepherd. This is, of course, um, always going to be challenged by this um, desire to revolt, this desire to split, this um, error of schism. We have seen that heresy attacks the teaching authority, schism attacks the governance authority, and scandal or even sacrilege attacks the sanctifying nature of the church, the sanctifying mission of the church. And so we see the strong words of Jesus Christ in the gospel, Matthew 18, 1 through 10, where he says to anyone, you know, that it is very, very bad and there is a serious consequence for those that cause scandal. Um, if you remember the first chart, if anyone become, if anyone comes between Christ and the cross, if, if anyone would, would put themselves ahead of Christ or prevent someone from coming to Christ, um, this is a serious thing. So we read here uh, Matthew's, uh, in Matthew's gospel and Jesus' words to us in this gospel. At that hour, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who thinkest thou is the greatest, greater in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, calling unto him a little child, set him in the midst of them, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And he that shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone should be hanged about his neck and that he should be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of scandals. For it must needs be that scandals come, but nevertheless woe to that man by whom the scandal cometh. And if thy hand or thy foot scandalize thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to go into life maimed 
or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye scandalize thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee having one eye to enter into life than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. See that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus takes scandal very, very serious. Uh, this is something that is so serious that um, obviously um, it, it could send us to hell. If we um, would get or prevent anyone from coming to Christ in any way, um, then this, this would actually be punishable by hell. So we have to make sure, as Jesus says, scandal will be present, but let it not be us that's causing the scandal. And one of the greatest scandals in the church is the fact that we say that the church is the communion of saints. In Article 9, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Well, why is it that the communion of saints, sometimes people within the church, happen to be the cause of so much scandal? And this can go one way or the other. Um, you know, a deacon once told me that every single baptized faithful person, people that say, I'm Christian or I'm Catholic, they are walking billboards. They will be either a billboard bringing people closer to Christ, or they will be a billboard bringing people away from Christ. And so as soon as we make that declaration that we are a follower of Christ, that speaks volumes. Um, the, uh, Billy Graham once said that the greatest cause of atheism today is Christians that profess Jesus with their mouth, but then deny him with their life. Um, we see this same sentiment, um, of course, way before Billy Graham, we see that in the Roman Catechism number 9, this is said, this is the Council of Trent, or the Catechism of Trent, and we also see this in the Vatican II documents. So first I want to read from the Roman Catechism. The Church Militant, that's the communion of saints here on earth, the Church Militant is composed of two classes of persons, the good and the bad, both professing the same faith and partaking in the same sacraments, yet differing in their manner of life and morality. So I want to say that one more time. The church militant is composed of two classes of persons, the good and the bad, both professing the same faith and partaking of the same sacraments, yet differing in their manner of life and morality. So on this triangle, you see that both the good and the bad, they're, they're accepting the teachings, right? They're saying, I believe in these teachings, and I believe in these sacraments that are sanctifying me, so they're, they're saying the same faith, professing the same faith, and receiving the same sacraments, the teaching and the sanctifying uh, parts of the triangle here. But where is the difference? The difference is in their life and their morality. Um, what, how are they actually living? And is their life matching with their faith? Um, Vatican II talked about the same thing, but said it in this way. The split, so this split between the faith, the sacraments, and then their life, um, Vatican II says, This split between the faith, which many profess, and their daily lives deserves to be counted among the more serious errors of our time. And so this is uh, what people do not want to see, and this is what Billy Graham said is the greatest cause of atheism, the greatest cause of um, th this that people would say, well, they're just hypocrites. They, they say this, or they teach this, and they believe this, and they accept these sacraments, but yet they believe something totally different. Unfortunately, some of the things that we see within the church are very scandalizing. For example, in 1955, about 75% of Catholics attended Mass. In 2017, 39% attended Mass, and that has even dropped even lower after COVID. Um, we see that 25% of Catholics, and I believe these are the 25% that are actually coming, um, only 25% believe in the teaching of the real presence. And so here we kind of jump up to the heresy part, the, the part of teaching, that you see that the teaching, the faith part, and the governing part and the sanctifying part are all interlinked. If someone is going to start teaching heresy, that's then going to uh, be scandalous. It's going to hurt other people's faith. It's going to hurt and cause scandal to people. And that could lead to either people leaving or people not wanting to come in, which is the schism, the unity part. So all of these are related to each other. We also see not only 25% believe, only 25% believe in the real presence, but it's, and I don't have the exact statistics, but they say 50% um, of the church are, of married couples 
um, are contracepting. They are, are flat out with their lives, not um, living out the teachings of the Catholic Church that contraception is an intrinsic evil. Um, we know that contraception is linked to abortion, and um, our own um, Supreme Court has said this in, in, in one of their cases, that we must have abortion in case contraception fails. And so there is a link between um, three intrinsic evils, uh, contraception, which will then lead to abortion, and then homosexual acts as well, which are sterile acts, which bring forth no life. And also these acts, these homosexual acts, are also intrinsic evil. So there is an acceptance. When, when we see an acceptance, even within the communion of saints, of these things, why is it that those within the church are accepting contraception? Why are they accepting abortion? Why are they accepting homosexual acts? Um, all three of these are just a few, but all three of these are examples of scandal. Um, they are example of how heresy and false teachings creep in to the church, but also creep in to the lives of the faithful. And they're an example of how people then will leave, stop practicing the faith altogether, or renounce, apostatize. And it also keeps people from entering in because they don't see any difference be between the world and the church. We'll now look at this triangle and the blue part, the teaching, the governing, and the sanctifying. We can see this as um, the body of the church. It's, it's the body that Jesus Christ established. It's the church that Jesus Christ established. It's as the church should function. The church should teach the faith. The church should govern the church and shepherd. The church should sanctify to make holy the communion of saints. That's why we're called saints. This is this blue teaching, governing, and sanctifying is how the body should work. What happens to the body, though? It's attacked by this virus. The viruses are heresy, schism, and scandal. So what is the medicine? What, what, is the, what is the remedy for this? And it would be the theological virtues that have been given to us. Faith combats heresy. Charity combats schism. And hope battles scandal. And how is this? Why is this? Because faith is two parts. Faith is what has been revealed to us. We, have, we know the truth because Jesus Christ is truth. Truth himself speaks truly or there's nothing true. And then the other part of faith is that we accept it. We assent to this truth. And we believe it simply because it's been revealed. And we believe it because who has revealed it. So faith will help restore, of course, this um, uh, or, or, or heal the heresy that is within the body of the church. Um, let's move on to hope. How does hope battle scandal? Well, scandal is that which would uh, prevent us from coming to Christ. And it's also that which would lead us to hell. And so, um, hope. Hope is two parts as well. We hope for the forgiveness of sins, and we hope for every grace needed to get to heaven. We do not want to be um, prevented in any way or prevent others from coming to Christ. We want the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of everyone's sins, and we want the graces necessary to get to heaven, to be with Christ forever. Now, but then forever in heaven. And then charity. Um, charity is that bond of love where we love our neighbor and we love God. That we, um, we can look at someone and maybe not like their personality, but we respect their authority. We respect the fact that they have been given authority. And so we love others in the church, the good and the bad. We love them. We may hate the sin that's in them, um, just like you would love a child but hate the cancer that is in the child. We love the members of the church, the communion of saints, and we love our bishops who are in authority over us, and we love our Holy Father who is in authority over us. And it is this charity, this patience, this love that keeps us united. It is this love, of course, that comes from Jesus Christ and is Jesus Christ himself, and we see how much Jesus Christ loves us. I particularly now want to look at how much he loved Judas. Um, so we see in Scripture, and we know this at least um, from what is written in Scripture, that there are six distinct times when Jesus says to Judas, I know what you're doing, you know what you're doing, you know what you're doing is wrong. He is trying, of course, to have Judas convert, to change. And in, in a way, of course, saying, as he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Um, and so we see this here, John 6, one of you is a devil. This is a, a year before the Last Supper. And then we, say at, we see at the Last Supper, one of you will betray me. We see at the Last Supper, not all, are, not all are clean. 
Woe to the man who betrays me. And again, one of you will betray me. And then we see one final offer of mercy. One final, um, I guess, time to, you know, really Judas for him to examine his conscience and to know that Jesus knows what he's going to do and Jesus is, is, is lovingly offering him this mercy. Jesus says, would you betray me with a kiss? And so what does this mean? This means that Jesus will always reach out to us. Joseph went and sought his brethren. Jesus will seek us, his brethren. He comes to seek us. He does not desire, God does not desire the loss. He does not want the loss of the sinner, but he wants the repentance of the sinner. But because of our stubbornness, our, our pride, our willingly persisting in sin, he will not, of course, go against our free will. So, But all he can do is, is beg us uh, to repent and give us every indication of, of his mercy. And so we see here, and in, in Mark 9, Jesus talks about this, Mark 9, 47, um, it'll be in hell where their worm dieth not and the fire is not extinguished. What does this mean? It means that, like Judas, those that choose their own place, there are only two places, a place with Christ and your own place. For those that choose their own place in this world and forever in hell, their worm, T-H-E-I-R, their worm will not die. What does this mean? This means our conscience will continue to dig and dig and dig. And so we, we thank you, Jesus, for giving us a conscience. And we thank you, Jesus, for, in your mercy, allowing our conscience to work correctly, stirring up our conscience like that worm stirring dirt so that we can come to you, so that we will never, ever, ever place sin between us and you but instead allow you to take the proper place and cast sin, Satan, and the devil away. Thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson in which we have looked at the Old Testament card, Joseph is betrayed, in its connection to the New Testament card, Judas betrays Jesus. We've been talking about Articles 7 and 9 of the Apostles' Creed. Take the time to visit the other um, uh, videos in this series, the Animode Shorts. You can look at those. There's uh, several videos. And then know all these uh, videos are based on the card deck, the Animode card deck, which is um, five games actually in one deck of cards. So check that out, um, and I'll continue to learn the faith uh, through these videos and through the card game. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.